smiling faces and welcoming faces. Um, hey, I have a lot up here, so let's go ahead and pray and get right into it. And I'm going to give you a forewarning, moistening up your fingers. We're going to look at a lot of scripture or your swiping finger or wherever you are. Um, Chuck, the young couple I asked you about, who was that? What were their names? Okay. Don't leave. I got a message for you. Okay. <laughs> Would you join me in prayer, please? Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you for saving us, redeeming us from the pit of hell. Father, we ask that you would be with us now. Help me, Lord, to properly bring forth your word in such a way that's understandable. And Lord, speak to our hearts today. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh-oh, I got the wrong teaching up here. Where did that come from? Okay. Fortunately, I always have a backup. Yes, okay. <laughs> Technology sometimes is great. Question for everyone here. How strong is your faith today? How far will your faith carry you? Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. And we're going to do that by looking at a very familiar story to most of us in here. If you're familiar with any part of the Old Testament, this story will be familiar to you. Um, please turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 13. Now, while you're doing that, on Wednesday nights at, our, at Manassas, we're traveling through the book of Genesis. Um, we just finished chapter 32, but in chapter 22... If you're familiar with the story, we have the testing of Abraham. Everybody know that story? Okay. God tells Abraham to take Isaac up to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him to the Lord. Now, if you remember the story, Isaac is the son of promise. We're all familiar with the story. This was a very big test for Abraham uh, to have to give up another one of his sons. Now, I say another son because if you recall, Abraham had a son before Isaac, Ishmael. But he was no longer part of the family because God told Abraham to send him away. Why? Because Sarah, his wife, didn't want Ishmael to share in the inheritance with her son, Isaac. So, once again, here is Abraham faced with this heartbreaking command of God to give up his son. Abraham loved Isaac just as he loved Ishmael. Yet, just as he had did with Ishmael, Abraham would obey God's command and make the three days journey, journey up to Moriah to sacrifice Isaac. Now you remember that this was not just a test to build Abraham's faith, but to see how far Abraham's faith would carry him. Would Abraham trust the Lord and do as he was told? That was the question. In the beginning, Chuck read a scripture that talked about if you're going through different trials, you're having different difficulties in your life. If you're going through something right now, you want to pay attention this morning. Now, God had already made Abraham quite a few promises, and they all would involve Isaac. You remember that, right? Remember that God promised Abraham that he was going to multiply his descendants more than the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. But how could this happen if Isaac was dead, right? If God told him to sacrifice him, he wouldn't be there. Well, let's look at what God promised Abraham. In chapter 13, beginning in verse 14, it reads, The Lord said to Abram, After Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from there from the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. Then Abraham moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and there he had built an altar to the Lord. 
Now turn to chapter 15. Chapter 15, beginning in verse 18. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river of the Euphrates. Now remember, at this point, there is yet to be a son born to Abraham, though one has already been promised by God. In chapter 16, Sarah comes up with this bright idea. She decides that she wants to give the Lord some help, since at this point, it seems obvious to her that a son would not be born to Abraham by her. After all, the Lord never did say that the son would come through her, at least not up to this point. So she looked to a custom of the time and gave her maid, to uh, Hagar, to Abraham as a second wife, that he might have a son through her. However, as we all know, this was not a part of God's plan. And the son born to, born to Abraham by Hagar, Ishmael, was not the heir that God had promised. Now turn to chapter 17. Chapter 17, we're going to begin in verse 6. And it reads, I will make, your, make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to, to covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan from an everlasting for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now drop down to verse 15. Same chapter, verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her, that I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. So let's stop right there. So now Sarah has the word. The child's going to come from her and Abraham. So with that said, we can see where there might be a problem for Abraham to have descendants if God wants to kill Isaac on the altar, right? We all know the story. At the last possible moment, God stops Abraham from sacrificing to Isaac, or sacrificing to Isaac, and thus demonstrating Abraham's total commitment and faith towards God. Abraham trusted God. So he went through with it. Although Abraham didn't know God's plan, he knew that God was faithful to keep his promise, even to the point of bringing Isaac back from the dead. Now, remember, up to this point in history, no one had ever heard of someone being raised from the dead. But Abraham trusted God. But here's the kicker. The test the testing of Abraham's faith never had to happen. Did you guys know that? It never had to happen. Why? What are you talking about, Reggie? God already knew that Abraham wouldn't withhold his son from him. God already knew that because he had built Abraham's trust and faith in him. Because God knows the heart of every man. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his way, according to the fruit of his doing. From the beginning, when God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans, he was building Abraham's faith. Why would God make Abraham leave his family and country? Well, we know that God was working with Abraham. But there was no mention of God working with any other member of his family. We know from Joshua that Abraham, or I should say Abram, as he was known at that time, and his family were idol worshipers. God had called Abram out of a family 
and in a city that had no faith in the true God to find out where Abraham's, Abraham's heart truly was. And from that point on, God was doing a work in Abraham. He was building his faith. Abraham would face other trials in his development of his faith. Remember, after media and arriving in the promised land, he encountered a famine. Sarah is taken from him, not just once, but twice. Abraham faced incredible odds in the battle of the four and five kings to rescue Lot. You remember that? God promised him many descendants, but time is passing him and Sarah by. They are getting older day by day, and still, there's no son up to this point. But then we move to chapter 21, and the Lord did as he promised, and Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son named Isaac. Now, we've already talked about Hagar and Ishmael and Sarah. Then he faced the ultimate trial in his life. God commands him to sacrifice Isaac. So, why take Abraham through all of this? Well, remember, he's God and he knows what he's doing. Abraham learned to trust God. Wolvert wrote this, quote, God's provision was not only a matter of faith for time, but it was also a matter of faith for eternity. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 10 reveals that in addition to accepting the promise that his descendants would inherit the land, Abraham looked forward to his own eternity, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Abraham had hope for his life, but he also had hope for a life to come, end quote. Forevermore, Abraham is known as the father of faith. Abraham had no doubt that all things were possible for God. I believe that the testing of Abraham's faith in chapter 22 was for our benefit as much as it was for Abraham's. This was so much, this was not so much a test to produce faith as it was a test to reveal faith. To reveal faith. God built Abraham slowly, piece by piece, year by year, into a man of faith. This test would reveal some of that faith that God had built into Abraham. That same building of faith that God did in Abraham, he is doing in you and I. The Bible tells us that God knows our heart. So, how could he not know what you and I need in building us up piece by piece to have faith and trust in all things in God? God's doing the work in all of our hearts. If we're believers here today, if we've committed our life to Jesus Christ, God's doing a work in us. Those trials and tribulations that you're going through day by day, week by week, a season of trials, a season of tribulations, it is having an effect. God is doing a work in you. He's building trust and faith in him. Because when we're going through those things, who do we cry out to? The Lord, right? We're crying out to him. First Kings chapter eight, verse 39 says, then here in heaven, your dwelling place and forgive and act and render to each according to all his ways, whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse nine says, as for you, my son Solomon, know that the God, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind for the Lord searches all hearts all hearts, that's all of our hearts, and understands every intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Are we seeking? Are we searching for the Lord? Are you spending time in your Bibles? Are you on your knees talking to him, communing with him? First Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, 
do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at what? The heart. At the heart. Your heart and my heart. Proverbs 21, 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the what? The heart. God already knew the heart of Abraham. He knows all of our hearts. The point that I'm trying to make is that God is in his infinite wisdom knew that the story of Abraham and Isaac would touch the hearts and minds of millions of, pe millions of people through the ages and give them hope and trust and faith in our God. Are you trusting him? Is your faith growing day by day? If your faith has come to the point where it's stagnant, then you have some work to do. You have some work to do. Psalm 62 verse 5 says this, My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He alone is my rock, my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. What more do we need to know? God is making it clear that he is there for us if we would put our faith and trust in him. How strong is your faith right now? Are you depending on God? Are you totally sold out for Jesus? How far will your faith take you in your next trial? Will you immediately start panicking and running around? Or will you go into your prayer closet and say, Lord, look at what's happening. Lord, help me. Be there for me. Are you sold out for him? Psalm 118 verse 6 says, The Lord is for me. He's for me. I'm talking to you. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. The Lord is on your side. You are a child of God. Are you living for him? You know, that book that's in your lap or on your phone, the Bible, is your life manual. It is the thing that tells us how we're supposed to conduct ourselves and live our lives as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this from Spurgeon. Quote, doubtless the reader has been tried with the temptations to rely upon the things which are seen instead of resting alone upon the invisible God. Christians often look to man for help and counsel and mar the noble simplicity of their reliance upon their God. Does this morning's portion meet the eyes of a child of God anxious about temporals? Then would we reason with him a while? You trust in Jesus and only in Jesus for your salvation. Then why are you troubled? Because of my great cares. It's not, is it not written, cast thy burden upon the Lord? Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication make your wants and unto God? Cannot you trust God for temporals? I wish I could. If you cannot trust God for temporals, how dare you trust him for spirituals? Can you trust him for your soul's redemption and not rely upon him for a few lesser mercies? Is not God enough for your need or is his all sufficiency too narrow for your wants? Do you want another eye behind I'm sorry, do you want another eye behind that of him who sees every secret thing? Is his heart faint? Is his arm weary? Is he so weak? I'm sorry, is he so? Seek another God. But if he is infinite, omnipotent, faithful, true, and all wise, why gaddest thou about so much to seek another confidence? Why dost thou rake the earth to find another foundation? when this is strong enough to bear all the weight which thou canst ever build upon. Christian, 
Mix not only thine wine with water. Do not mix the gold of faith with the dross of human confidence. Wait thou only upon God and let thine expectations be from him. Covet not Jonah's gourd, but rest in Jonah's God. Let the sandy foundation of terrestrial trust be the choice of fools. But do thou, like one who foresees the storm, build for thyself an abiding place upon the rock of ages, end quote. Is God your rock? Is he your foundation? Are you building your faith on the foundation of Jesus Christ? If you are not, see me after the service and we'll talk and we'll pray. What is the condition of your faith right now at this very moment? Will it be when the debt is high? What will it be when the debt is high and the bank account is low? Is your trust only in your bank account? Can you solve every problem in your life by writing a check for it? What will it be when the aches and pains of, of your physical frame seem so to overwhelm you and the doctors have no answers? Is it woe is me? Or do you gather together with the saints and say, pray for me? Because you know that the great healer is your heavenly father. You have a relationship with the true and living God. Will you remember the encouraging words of our dear Lord in John chapter 16, verse 33? These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have done what? Overcome the world. Here's the great thing about our God, guys. He warns us that we will have tribulations in this life. It's not a surprise to us. If you're reading your Bible, you know that you will face tribulations and trials in this life. But the good news follows that. He lets you know, I got this. I got this. I've overcome the world. Abraham was a man of faith. Paul wrote about the faith of Abraham in Romans chapter 4, verse 3. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited unto him as righteousness. Paul quotes Genesis 5, 15, 4. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man will not be your heir, but one will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it unto him as righteousness. The son wasn't born yet. And yet God made Abraham these promises about this son. The stars in the sand were all, so many descendants did you not be accounted. But the son wasn't born yet. But Abraham believed God. Will you believe God's promises to you? They're in the book. Read it for yourself. Don't, don't listen to me. Look them up for yourself. The extraordinary, unwavering belief that Abraham had in God's power and promises was what Paul recounted. In Romans chapter 4, verse 18, he writes, In hope against hope, we believe, so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken. So shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to perform. That's our God. That's our God. What he's able to perform, what he's able to do. Where's your faith today? Brothers and sisters, the same God that Abraham showed this complete faith in is the same God that we were worshiping just a few minutes ago. Nothing is too hard for our God. Nothing is impossible for God. That is an example for all of us today. 
But without faith, it's impossible to please God. Be strong in your faith. Trust him, regardless of the circumstances you're in. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Beginning to read in verse 9, it says, By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which, found who, which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself <clears throat> received the ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead, at, th as th at that, as many descendants as the stars of, the, of heaven, in, the, in numbers, and in innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. The promises that God made Abraham were, were solid. They were solid. Guess what? The same promises he makes to us, they're solid. You can trust them. You can depend on them. You live by those. That's how you work your life through the promises of God. We too must live our lives as strangers and pilgrims upon this earth, waiting patiently and, and, and with faith for the kingdom of God to be established on earth, ruling from Jerusalem. We too are sojourners desiring a better heavenly country, a country that's coming in the future. In other words, brothers and sisters, you know that this is not our home, right? This is not our home. This is a layover. Anybody ever do a layover when they fly? Anybody do a layover? Yeah? Got a question for you. When you do that, did that layover, did you run out to Home Depot and grab a bunch of lumber and stop off at the, at the local furniture store and buy a bed and <laughs> furniture and take it back to the airport and start building walls and you know, setting up housekeeping in an airport? No, because you knew your next flight was only a little while away. That's what's happening here with us. This is a layover. Our home is with the Lord, our Heavenly Father. And we're going to be with Him one day. The Bible says, let us not be conformed to, um, to the image of this world. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We have a job to do while we're here. You know that, right? All of us have a job. I teach a class at the jail in Manassas. And I tell the guys that God has a plan for every single one of those men, every single one of those inmates. Now, whether they live up to it is up to them. But he has a plan for every single one of our lives. And so we wonder, well, Lord, what is, what is my calling? What is my calling? Well, we have mandates that we can't, as all of us have. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that God commanded you, and Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That's not a request, brothers and sisters. That's a command. That's a command. Who are you talking to about Jesus? Who are you witnessing to? What about that loved one that's going through it? The drug addict, the alcoholic, okay? The one who's destitute, the one in your family that you keep, you, you, you care so much about, and you've tried, and you've tried, you've talked to them. Talk to them again. What's the worst that they could do to you? Say, get out of my face, leave me alone. I was telling Chuck and them downstairs, I lost a dear friend of mine on Friday. For years, I tried to talk to Mark about his need for Jesus, and he, he just he didn't want to have anything to do with it. You would think that I would feel okay, but when I heard that he had passed away, there was a, 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 a 
few hours that I just sat and just thought about the fact if I had just had one more time to talk to him, one more time, who is that loved one that you've been trying to reach? Talk to him again. If they get offended, is that it? Are they attacking you? We have a job to do. Abraham's willingness to give up his son was a type of God, the father's willingness to give up his only begotten son as a sacrifice. We who are of the faith of Abraham must also believe that God can resurrect the dead. We need to do what our father Abraham did. We need to believe that God can do the impossible and nothing is too hard for our God. Our God. We need to believe in God's power and promises without wavering. We need to believe and be willing to, and willingly obedient to God to come out of this world and depart from sin. Are you still struggling with the sin in your life? Repent. You're not alone. We've all been there. Some of us are still dealing with things in our life. Give it to the Lord. Again, we were talking downstairs. Do you guys know that God will, my belief, is that God won't take a sin from you that you enjoy? <coughs> Jason was telling the story about quitting smoking. If you love smoking that cigarette, you love it. Ask God first to give you a hatred for that cigarette. Then deliverance. Because at some point, God's gonna, that cigarette's gonna say, taste so bad in your mouth. You're going to wonder how you ever did it. We must learn to trust in the true and living God. Listen to this from Oswald Chambers. Quote, God's people have their trials. It was never designed by God when he chose his people that they should be a untried people. Did you know that? They were chosen in the furnace of affliction. They were never chosen to worldly peace and earthly joy. Freedom from sickness and the pains of morality was never promised them. But when their Lord drew up the charter of privileges, he included chastisement among the things to which they should inevitably be heirs. Trials are a part of our lot. They were predestined for us in Christ's last legacy. So surely as the stars are fashioned by his hands, and their orbit fixed by him, so surely are our trials allotted to us. He has ordained their season and their place, their intensity and the effect they shall have upon us. Good men must never expect to escape trouble. If they do, they will be disappointed for none of their predecessors have been without them. Mark the patience of Job. Remember Abraham, for he had trials and by his faith under them, he became the father of faith. Note well the biography of all the patriarchs, the prophets, the apostles, the martyrs, and you shall discover none of those whom God made vessels of mercy who were not made to pass through the fire, who were not made to pass through the fire of affliction. It is ordained of old that the cross of trouble should be engraved on every vessel of mercy as the royal mark mark by where, whereby the king's vessel of honor are designed. But although tribulation is thus the path of God's children, they have the comfort of knowing that their master has traver traversed it before them. They have his presence and sympathy, sympathy to cheer them, his grace to support them, his example to teach them how to endure. And when they reach the kingdom, it will more than make up make amends for the much tribulation through which they pass to enter it. Faith's way of walking is to cast all cares upon the Lord and then to anticipate good results from their worst calamity. Like Gideon's men, he does not fret over the broken pitcher, but rejoices that the lamps blaze forth the more. Out of the rough oyster shell of difficulty shall extract the rare pearl of honor. And from the deep ocean caves of distress, she lifts up the priceless coral of experience. When her flood of prosperity ebbs, 
she finds treasures hidden in the sands. And when her son of delight goes down, she turns her telescope of hope to the starry promise of heaven. When death itself appears, faith points to the light of resurrection beyond the grave, thus making our dying sorrows to be our living hope." End quote. Brothers and sisters, we are sons and daughters of the living God. Death has lost its sting for us. We close our eyes here, and what happens? The next time we open our eyes, where are we? In the presence of the living God. The incident with Isaac reveals more clearly than any other the maturity of Abraham's faith. As stated in the Hebrews, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Abraham had such confidence in God that he believed that out of the ashes of the sacrifice, the sacrifice Isaac consumed as a burnt offering, he would be restored in resurrection to his father to fulfill the promise of God. And technically he was. In a similar way, Christians can point to the empty tomb and to the resurrected Christ and believe the miracle of power revealed on that resurrection morning. As Abraham pinned his hopes on his son who in, a figure, in, who in a figure was resurrected from the dead, the Christian can put his trust in one who literally died for his sin and literally rose from the grave. Abraham was a man of faith who believed he could live in God's place, who believed in God's provisions for him in time and eternity, who believed the promises of the son whom God would give him miraculously, and who believed in God's divine power of resurrection. Our Christian faith today stands upon the same foundation. Like Abraham, we are called to live by faith in the living God, who will accomplish for us in time and eternity all that he has promised in his love and grace. Our God, not a God, the true and living God. Where is your faith right now? How strong is your faith right now? That's the question this morning. Can you answer that question in your heart? How far will your faith carry you in your next trial? Will you panic? Will you start pulling your hair out? Do you get on the phone with family and friends and do the woe is me cry? Or before you call anybody, do you call on your heavenly father? I want to end with this from Spurgeon. We may regard the father of faithful, I'm sorry, let me start over. Quote, we may regard the father of the faithful as being a pattern of his children. As God dwelt with Abraham, so he will deal in measure with all of those who, uh, of all, with all of those who, as believers, are the children of believing Abraham. Everything that will abide, everything that will abide in the fire shall go through the fire that it may be bought both proven and improved. We clearly understand that when God is said to tempt Abraham, the word used does not carry its ordinary meaning. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil and neither tempteth he with, it, with any man. But Jehovah is accustomed to try and test his people. And this is what we are here to understand. The revised version renders the word, God did prove Abraham. And as I have said, God works by the same method with all his saints. Of course, we shall not obtain to the same stature that Abraham reached, Neither shall we all be tried by the same tests that were applied to him. But every one of us shall be tested, like Abraham, if indeed we are believers in God. He was the Columbus who, by faith, went out and discovered a better country, that is, a heavenly, and his track has been followed by many other voyagers. Not without storms did he cross the sea, and we, too, who venture after him on the voyage of faith 
but ex must expect to meet with contrary winds and waves sweeping high. We may look for considerable measure of conformity in our lives to the life of the great patriarch, and we must not be astonished as though some strange thing has happened to us if great and severe tests should be upon us upon us before the chapter of life is over. None of us ought to object to this. Shall the child of faith be otherwise than the father of faith? I may say of Abraham what our Lord said of him, the disciple is not above his master nor the servant above his Lord. Shall the believer, saved and justified by faith as Abraham was, rebel against the sharing Abraham's rebel against sharing Abraham's lot. We shall sit down by and by at the same table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of our God, our God. Surely we may be content to fare on the road as they fared. In fact, I hope you will say concerning Abraham, whether thou goest, I will go, and where thou liest, I will lie. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. We are willing to take the portion of the righteous. We will not say with the wretched Baal, let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. We would have a far better desire than that. May my way be the way of the righteous, that my end may be like his. May I have a portion with you, with your people, O God, and do you deal with me as you do with all those that love your name. Are we any better than the patriarchs? They went, has anybody ever heard, in here read, um, uh, um, what's it, Martyrs, the Martyrs book, Fox's book, book of Martyrs? Have you ever read that? Pick that up, it's a small book. But it talks about all the people through history who have suffered for Christ, who've given their life for the gospel. Fox's Book of Martyrs, great book, great book. Have we gone to that point? The persecution for the Christian is upon us. You guys know that, right? It's happening in other parts of the world and it's coming here. For believing what you believe and standing where you stand on the word of God, that persecution is coming. How will you stand? How will you stand? Our pastor is right now preaching this Sunday on the transgender movement. Last week, last three weeks, he was preaching on LGBTQT. Do you think the persecution is not coming for us because we take a stand on what's right and what's wrong? We had this discussion this morning. Either the word of God is true or it's not. Either it's for real or it's not to us. It's real. Do we compromise? Our culture is saying make compromises. Are you compromising? For those of you who want to pass out communion, go, you want to go ahead? I don't want to compromise. The word of God is the word of God. It's truth. And unfortunately, even in Christendom right now, Many churches are making compromises. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to know the word of God. Because when you're faced with that choice, you will know how to stand. Read your Bibles. Understand. Attend Bible studies. Okay. There's so many resources out there for us to help us to learn. I want to be faithful to my Lord and faithful to his word. How about you?